on this video we're going to talk about uh, sequences so we're going to use this notation this symbolism that we're going to represent a sequence using these braces so different sequences will just get different letters like the sequence a sub n or b sub n or c sub n and what that means is we're just going to get these different numbers in a pattern in a list so some examples that you may have uh, be familiar with are like the even numbers form a sequence, two, four, six, eight, on and on and on. So we just keep adding two each time. You may recognize and be familiar with the Fibonacci sequence where you start with one, one, then you add those together to get the next term two, and then you add the one and the two to get three, and then you add the previous two terms to get the next one. And then the blue sequence, 6, 12, 24, we start with 6 and multiply by 2 each time. So those are all se examples of sequences. In general, a sequence can be thought of as a pattern of numbers, or more formally, as a function whose domain is the positive integers. So in general, we're going to think of that first term as being the first term and call it a sub 1. We will make exceptions sometimes and start at perhaps 0 and call the first term a sub 0. But uh, in general, we'll start with 1. A sequence can be either finite or infinite. So we have some different ways of defining uh, sequences. One is known as an explicit, explicit definition. So this is like a formula for how to find any term in the sequence we want. So if we want to, say in part A, find the first six terms, we're going to start with n equals 1. So the first term, a sub 1, is going to be, and then we're just going to plug in 1 everywhere we see an n. So negative 1 to the first is negative 1, negative 1 squared is 1, plus 1 is 2. So that makes the first term uh, negative 1 half. The second term, we'll just come back and plug in 2s. So negative 1 to the second is positive 1. 2 squared is 4, plus 1 is 5, so the second term is 1 fifth. And the third term, we'll get a negative 1 on top and a 10 on the bottom. And a sub 4 will be a positive 1 over 17. a sub 5 is going to be a negative 1 over 26, and a sub 6 is going to be a positive 1 over 37. So you can see this negative 1 to the n is going to be uh, an expression we'll see pretty regularly. It gives us that alternating uh, sign pattern that we start with either a positive or negative and then alternate. Now if we want to find a sub 100, this is fairly simple to do in an explicit definition because, whoops, is my left-handedness coming into play. So we're just going to take negative 1 to the hundredth over 100 squared plus 1. So easy in the sense that we just plug in uh, 100 for the n. So negative 1 to an even power is positive. 100 squared is going to be a 1 with four zeros, which is 10,000. Adding 1 to that will be 10,001. So there's the 100th term. Okay, now a recursive definition, in contrast to an explicit definition, is we will be given the first term in the sequence and then how to get the next term from the previous term. So this can be written, sometimes you'll see it like this is, a sub n equals something to do with a sub n minus 1. Alternatively, that could be written as a sub 1 plus n equals a sub n plus 3. So those are equivalent to each other. They're telling us how to get the next term given the previous term. Uh, but to find the first four terms, then we're going to have to do these in order. So the first term is going to be 5. That was given to us. The next term, we're going to take that previous term. So a sub 2 is going to be a sub 1 plus 3. So when you add 3 to the 5, that will give us 8. And then we'll add 3 to that term to get 11. 
add 3 to that term, and we'll get the 14. So this is how we do a recursive, uh, how we find terms in a recursive formula or recursive definition. Now to find a sub 8, different than in an explicit definition sequence, we can't just plug in 8 because we need to know the seventh term before we can get the eighth term. So we have to build our way up to that. So we already know the first four terms. So then the fifth term, we're going to add three. The sixth term, we're going to add three again. The seventh term, we're going to add three again. So we need to know that seventh term before we can see that we're going to get the, the, um, the eighth term will be the seventh term plus another three. So kind of awkward or inefficient to find uh, if we just want to know a particular term. Okay, here's another example. So in the in the same uh, kind of genre as the as the uh, Fibonacci sequence. Here, we're given this recursively, but we're given the first two terms. So our first term is a sub 1. The second term, we're told, is negative 1. And now to get the next term, so to get, since we know a sub 1, a sub 2, to get the third term, we're going to take the second term minus the first term. So that is, we're going to take negative 1 minus the 1, that's going to make that be a negative 2. Then to get the fourth term, we're going to take the third term minus the second term. So the third term was negative 2 minus the second term was negative 1 is going to bring us back to a negative 1. And then the fifth term is going to be the fourth term minus the third term, so that's going to be a negative 1 minus the negative 2, and we're back to a positive 1. Okay, so there's the first five terms. Now, we will talk about two, um, two sequences in particular that uh, we will work with quite a bit and that will come up pretty regularly. And one is called arithmetic. It's spelled the same as arithmetic, but in the, in the context of sequence, it's called an arithmetic sequence and a geometric sequence. So an arithmetic sequence has the form a comma a plus d comma a plus 2d comma dot dot dot, and the nth term is going to be given by a plus n minus 1d and then you can go on from there. So the D is known as the common difference. So to get the next term from the previous term, we're just going to add D each, term, each time. So here's our uh, arithmetic uh, formula, is we can, uh, our recursive formula rather. The first term is going to be A, and the nth term, you're going to take the previous term and add D to it. This gives us here our, uh, our explicit formula. We can say a sub n is going to be a, the first term, plus n minus 1 times d. So there's our formula for the nth term of any arithmetic sequence. So let's look at some examples. For each of these, uh, we have uh, three different sequences there, the green, the blue, and the red. <clears throat> For each of those, can we first find the common difference? Then can we find the ninth term? Can we come up with a recursive rule? And can we come up with an explicit rule? So for the first one, the green one, uh, for part A, the common difference, we can see negative 2 minus negative 5 is going to be a positive 3. And that's the same thing as 1 minus negative 2 and for any other pair of successive terms. Another way of thinking of that is if you start with negative 5, to get the next term, you're going to add 3. And to get the next term, you'll add another 3. And so on, you'll keep adding 3. So we will say our common difference 
is a positive 3. So that's our answer to part A. Part B, the ninth term, we can see, well, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the sixth term, we know we're going to add 3 and get 10. And the seventh term, we know we're going to add 3 and get 13. The eighth term, we know we can add another 3. And the ninth term, we can add 3 and get 19. Alternatively, we could have answered this question, the explicit rule, and we know since this is arithmetic that a sub n is going to be the first term, which is negative 5, plus n minus 1 times d, which we said was 3. So we could say that our ninth term, using this formula, will be negative 5 plus 9 minus 1 is 8 times 3, and negative 5 plus 24 also gets us that answer of 19. So that's also, this is our, we could either write it this way for part D, or we could, if you want to clean it up, we could say negative 5 plus 3n minus 3, and maybe more efficiently or compactly write that as 3n minus 8, that a sub n is 3n minus 8. In the recursive formula, part C, let me slide this up a little bit. So part C, we would say that a sub 1, our first term, is going to be negative 5, and a sub n is going to be a sub n minus 1 plus 3. So these two, for recursive formula or recursive definition, you need two things. Where does it start, and how do you get the next term from the previous term? Okay, Let's see if we can do the blue one. That one's pretty interesting. So this, believe it or not, uh, is an arithmetic sequence. So if we think of what is natural log 6 minus natural log 2, if we dig deep and use our properties of logarithms, 6 minus the natural log, whoops, 6 divided by 2, which is the natural log of 3. And similarly, if you take the natural log of 18 minus the natural log of 6, our property of logarithms says that that's also the natural log of 3. So crazily enough, our common difference is the natural log of 3. That's our answer to part A. The A sub 9, then, <clears throat> Uh, well, let's, let's come back to that one. Let's get our recursive rule. So our recursive rule is going to be that we're going to start with the natural log of 2. And the next term is going to be the previous term plus a natural log of 3. And our explicit rule, so our answer to part D, is going to be that a sub n will be our a sub 1, which is natural log of 2, and then plus n minus 1 times d, which is our natural log of 3. And you'd be fine just to leave it like that. Let's just do that. Now let's see if we can maybe use that uh, part d to get our ninth term. So a sub 9 is going to be <clears throat> natural log of 2 plus 9 minus 1 is 8 times the natural log of 3, which would be fine. We can just leave it like that. And if we wanted to uh, be more creative, we could say natural log of 2 plus and then bring that into our exponent, 3 to the 8th. I'm going to have to cheat here and throw that on my calculator. So 3 to the 8th is 6561. So that would be natural log of 2 plus the natural log of 6,000 
561. And finally, using our property of logarithms, that when you add two logarithms, you multiply their insides. 2 times 6,561 is 13,122. Crazy, crazy. Okay, well, I didn't leave myself enough room, but let's see if we can uh, figure out that third one, the red one. I think it's going to be significantly simpler. Our common difference, part A, if we just take the second term minus the first term and the third term minus the second term, we can see this is kind of an outlier, a strange case, that our common difference is going to be just zero. So the ninth term, that's not too hard to figure out. Our a sub 9 is just going to be 1, as is a sub 1 and a sub 2 and anything else. Our recursive rule is going to be we're going to start at 1, and our next term is going to be the previous term plus 0. And our, let me get my pen back, our uh, explicit formula is going to be just a sub n is equal to 1. Okay, let's see what else we got. So a geometric sequence um, is going to be uh, anything in the form a, a times r, a times a, r to the second, plus dot dot dot, a times r to the n minus 1, and on. So this is telling us here <coughs> that our explicit formula is going to be a sub n is going to be that first term a times r to the n minus 1. So these are sequences where you multiply uh, the previous term by the sum num same number over and over again. And so here's our recursive formula. You're going to start with wherever you start. To get the next term, you're going to multiply by the same number over and over again. So here's going to be our um, the questions we're going to try to answer for each of these different sequences. So we found the common ratio by subtracting successive terms. I'm sorry, we found the common difference by subtracting successive terms. We find the common ratio by dividing successive terms. So the second term divided by the first term is negative 2. The third term divided by the second term is also negative 2, and that's how we can tell that it's going to be geometric and that the r is going to be negative 2. So that's the answer to part a. I'm going to go ahead and go down to that explicit rule because we saw how to get that. So our answer to part d is going to be a sub n is going to be that first term, which in our case is 1 times the r, which we said is negative 2, to the n minus 1 power. So there's our answer to part d. Then I'm going to use that to find our answer to part b and get that the eighth term, so a sub 8, is going to be 1 times negative 2 to the seventh power. And so uh, negative to an odd power is going to be negative. I think 2 to the 6th is 64, so I think 2 to the 7th will be a negative 128. And our recursive formula is we're going to say we're going to start with 1, and the next term will be the previous term times negative 2. So there's our recursive definition. Okay, so the second one, we can see what our common ratio is by taking a previous term, or a term, divided by the previous term. And using our property of exponents, when we take negative 1 minus negative 2, that's going to be 10 to the first. Then we can see, ah, uh, yes, we're just multiplying by 10 each time to get the next term. So our part A, the common ratio, is going to be 10. I'm going to go ahead and jump down to D again and say that our uh, formula, our explicit formula, is going to be A sub n is the first term, which is 10 to the negative 2 times 10 to the 
n minus 1 power, which you're fine to leave it that way, or because these are both powers of 10, we could use our property of exponents and say that's going to be negative 2 plus n minus 1 would be n minus 3. So that's kind of an efficient way of writing our explicit formula. A sub n is 10 to the n minus 3. Can you bump that with my hand? I'm back now. So, let me get my pen back up. So now we can answer B. Our eighth term, A sub 8, is going to be 10 to the 8 minus 3 power. That's going to be 10 to the 5th, which is going to be a 1 followed by five zeros. So I guess that'll be 100,000. And part C, our recursive formula, is A sub 1 is going to be 10 to the negative 2, and our nth term is going to be the previous term, a sub n minus 1, times 10. Here we're back now to that odd uh, formula we saw before when we were talking about arithmetic sequences, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. We can also think of this as being a geometric sequence because we can see that the common ratio is going to be the any term divided by its previous term is just 1. So part A, this is can be considered a geometric sequence with a common ratio of 1. And our eighth term is going to be like every other term. It's going to be 1. And our recursive formula would be start at 1, and we're going to get the next term by taking our previous term times 1, and our uh, explicit formula will be a sub 1 times 1 to the n minus 1, which is really just 1. It's kind of an odd case when it can be considered both geometric and arithmetic. So here's a tougher one. So let's see if we can find our common ratio r. If we take a previous term, or a term, divided by its previous term, that's going to be 8 27 times, <clears throat> we'll multiply by the reciprocal, and we can do some canceling. 27 goes into 81 three times, 8 goes into 16 twice, so that's going to make our common ratio be 3 halves. So that's our answer to part A. So I'm going to come back to A sub 8 later. We can do uh, part um, C, the recursive formula. We can say the first term is 16 over 81, and the nth term is going to be our previous term times 3 halves. Our explicit formula is going to be a sub 1, which is 16 81st, times 3 halves to the n minus 1 power. And that would be fine. We can do it that way. If you want, you could think of that as being 16 is 2 to the 4th, and we can take that 3 over 2 to the n minus 1, and think of that as 3 to the n minus 1. The 81 is 3 to the 4th, and we've got a 2 to the n minus 1 there. So if you want to look at, I'm going to maybe split this and write it in a different order, where the 2's are over each other, and the 3's are also over each other, the powers of 3. Then we can use our property of exponents, if you like. And I lost my pen. So the, that would be 2 to the 4 minus n minus 1, which is going to be 2 to the, that's going to be 5 minus n power times 3. And then we've got 3 to the n minus 1 minus 4. That's going to be n minus 5 power. So I don't know if that's any help or not, but that's another way of writing that explicit formula. 
And finally, I think we're ready maybe to tackle a sub 8, which is going to be 2 to the 5 minus 8 times 3 to the 8 minus 5, which is going to be 2 to the negative 3 times 3 to the 3, which is going to be 3 to the 3rd over 2 to the 3rd, which is 27 eighths. That's just one way to do it. Okay. Let's talk about our, this idea of a limit of, of a sequence. Let L be a real number, then our sequence, which we denote with this braces, a sub n, has a limit L as n approaches infinity if, given any positive number epsilon, there is a positive number capital M, such that for every n greater than capital M, we have that the difference between our term in the sequence and that limit is less than epsilon. We write the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals L, and we say the limit converges. So just kind of visually what this is trying to say, I'm going to come right up over here maybe. So suppose we have an x-y axis, and we're uh, approaching, uh, We, if we want to say this limit is going to approach L. So here is maybe y equals L. Then the terms of our sequence are just going to be getting closer and closer to L. So maybe the terms in our sequence come down from something that was bigger than L, and they just get closer and closer. That's one way that a term, that a sequence could converge. But it could also do something like maybe it starts uh, here and then it comes above, but each of these terms is still getting closer and closer. And it would also be okay if the terms in the sequence, maybe they approached here and then at some point they just became L from that point on. So any of those scenarios is going to be an example of a sequence that is converging to L. So that means as we go further and forth, further out there to the right, the, the terms of the sequence are going to get closer and closer to L. Okay, so using that idea. Now we also say here um, that uh, if a sequence does not converge, then it diverges. So it's an either-or categorization. Either a sequence converges and it's going to get closer and closer to some single number, or it diverges. There's no other in-between. So if we look at something like the green uh, sequence, that is, if we write that out, the first term is 1, 2, 3, 4, on and on and on. So you can see as we go further and further out, it is not uh, getting closer and closer to a single number. So we will say then that the series diverges because it's not getting closer and closer to a single number. Now the blue sequence, 1 half to the first, and then 1 half to the fourth, and then 1 half to the, I'm sorry, 1 half to the second, 1 half to the third, 1 half to the fourth, and so on, we're getting something that is getting closer and closer to zero. So we are going to say the limit is zero. Or we would say the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is equal to zero. And the red sequence, if we write this out, the first term, negative 1 to the first is negative 1. Negative 1 squared is positive 1 negative 1 cubed is back to negative 1, and so on. So this is just going to keep alternating. So uh, our definition says that if it's getting closer and closer to a single number, it converges, but this is not getting closer and closer to a single number. And if it doesn't converge, then it must diverge. And so it doesn't have to go to infinity, but this sequence diverges. Okay, some properties of limits. I think these pretty much make sense. If uh, the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is L, and the limit as n goes to infinity of b sub n is M, then the limit of their sum is the sum of their individual limits. 
the limit of their difference is the difference in their limits. The limit of their product is the product of their limits. And the limit of a constant times the function is a constant times that limit. And the limit of their quotient is the quotient of their limits unless the denominator goes to zero and then all bets are off. So using that reasoning, we can think of, uh, we can do this a couple of ways, but one way to think of this is to think of it as the limit as n goes to infinity of 2n over n, and then minus the limit as go n goes to infinity of 1 over n. And we can see that, hopefully, that that first limit is going to just go to 2. The second one is going to go to 0. And so that limit will be 2. The next one is maybe a little harder to see. But if we think of maybe factoring that square root of 3 out, it's really a constant times e to the 1 half, uh, not plus, but comma, e to the 1 fourth, e to the 1 eighth, and on and on and on. And you don't really have to write it symbolically, but you might see that as e to the 1 over 2 to the n power is going to be that sequence. And we can kind of work our way inside out as we see that the 1 over 2 to the n part is going to go to 0. And so this is going to approach square root of 3 times e to the 0. And we know e to the 0 is 1. And so um, the limit is going to be the square root of 3. It's kind of like arithmetic with limits there. Okay. So let's see if we can figure out, first of all, does the limit converge or diverge? And then secondly, if it does converge, what is it getting close to? What is that limit L? So let's maybe write out a few terms here. If we plug in 1, we're going to get negative 1 to the first is negative 1. And then we're going to get that times 1 minus 1 is 0. And so our first term is going to be 0. The second term is going to be negative 1 squared is 1. Uh, 2 minus 1 is 1. All over 2 is going to be 1 half. The third term is going to be negative 1 to the third is negative 1. 3 minus 1 is 2. And that's going to be over 3 is going to be a negative 2 thirds. The, what do we have to the 1, 2, 3, 4th term is going to be a positive 1 times 3 over 4. So that's going to be a positive 3 fourths. And maybe you can see a pattern. It's going to be then a negative 4 fifths and a positive 5 sixths and so on. So what these are approaching is you can kind of see that uh, this negative 1 to the n is making things alternate in sign, but as n gets really, really big, this n minus 1 over n is going to approach 1. So because of the alternating signs, these are going to start approaching, it's going to start alternating numbers that are getting closer and closer to positive 1 or negative 1. Since that is not getting closer and closer to a single number, we will say that it does not converge, therefore the sequence diverges. The next one, if we write out a few terms, I think we'll see pretty quickly. 4 is the first term, then we're going to add 2 and get 6. We'll add 2 to that and get 8, and I think we see that's going to blow up and go towards infinity. So we will say the sequence diverges. The next one, uh, we can see that uh, when you plug in 1, we'll get a negative 0.9. The second term, when you square the negative 0.9, you're going to get a positive 0.81. The next one is going to be a negative, but I don't think we have to do too much work to see that when you multiply a number by itself, so ignore for a minute the negative sign, but if you multiply a number that's less than 1 by itself, 
you're going to get something that's smaller than what you started with. So in absolute value, these numbers are all going to be getting smaller. They'll be alternating in sign, but since they are going towards zero, we will say it's going to converge to zero, or the limit is going to be zero. We have what's known as the sandwich theorem for sequences. So if the limit of one sequence goes to the same limit as another sequence, and if there is some place after which all the terms uh, fit into this relationship, that b sub n, the terms of the sequence b sub n, are in between the terms of a sub n and c sub n, then since uh, both a sub n and c sub n are approaching that same limit L, then the limit of B sub n must also be L. It's going to be sandwiched in between there. So something like a cosine of n over n is a nice one to use because we know that the cosine is always going to be uh, less than or equal to 1 and greater than or equal to negative 1. And if you take the limit as n goes to infinity of negative 1 over n and positive 1 over n, they're both going to go to 0. And so we're going to squeeze or sandwich our, our sequence cosine of n over n into in between 0 and 0. And so that means the limit as n goes to infinity of cosine of n over n must also be 0. We have what's known as an absolute value theorem. So it says if the limit as the absolute value of the, the terms of a sequence go to 0, then so does the sequence itself go to 0. And that's just a use of that sandwich theorem. We know that the if uh, that the terms of a sequence are in between the absolute value of the sequence and the negative of the absolute value of that sequence. And if uh, the absolute value is going to zero, then these are both going to go to zero, and that's going to force the terms to go to zero. So if we have something like a uh, sine of negative 1 to the n over n, since we know that the sine... Oops, I lost my pen. Since we know the sine of negative x is the negative of sine x, then we know that we can, if we take the absolute value of sine of negative 1 to the n over n, if we put that in absolute values, then that will be the same as the sine of 1 over n as n goes to positive infinity, since we're just using... I need that n in there still, since we're just using positives. So we can then say that the limit as n goes to infinity of our sine of 1 over n to the n, we can make that same argument that we did earlier with the cosine of n over n, or we can say, actually, this is just going to go to, since the 1 over n will kind of work our way inside out, so 1 over n to the n is going to go to 0, which is going to make this limit go to uh, sine of 0, which we know is equal to 0. And then, since the limit of the absolute value goes to 0, so does the limit of the original sequence go to zero, okay?